and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Well, hello everybody. And we're just thrilled to have as a special guest, Jeffrey Zeig, who's the head of uh, and founder of the Milton Erickson Foundation in Scottsdale, Arizona. And most of you know, but some of you don't know that Jeff is the person who has organized for many years the awesome Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference. It used to be, I think, every five years, and now it's every four years. And it's, it's I'm sure, the, the biggest and friendliest and most awesome and delight, delightful psychotherapy conference in the world. It's in Anaheim. It's going to be December, I think, 9 to 13. Is that correct, Jeff? Correct. And uh, it's one you, you don't want to miss. You'll, you'll hear all of the gurus, all of the famous people, your, your favorite teachers. Uh, there'll be probably five or 7,000 people or, or even more. And it's just such an honor to have you on the podcast, Jeffrey, to tell us about the history of the conference, what's going to be happening this year that's special. In addition, uh, you may want to talk about why you started the Milton Erickson Foundation. I know you have a deep regard for Milton Erickson, and you yourself are also one of the world's top hypnotists using the uh, amazing indirect hypnotic techniques that you learned from Erickson and also created uh, as well, and have had an amazing life in promotion of events going back to the 60s when you were, I think, helping to promote the Joan Bias, among other amazing yes. things. So why don't we just turn the, the floor over to you and you can just start babbling and talking and we'll ask you questions and we'll get all excited. Well, one of the joys about the Evolution Conference is that I get to spend time with you because you're certainly one of the principal members of the faculty. So the Evolution Conference, well, let's think a little bit about the history of psychotherapy. Psychotherapy started in 1885 when Freud first became interested in the psychological aspects of medicine. That's uh, according to some historians. So in 1985, the 100th anniversary of the conception of psychotherapy, we held the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference in Phoenix, Arizona. More than 7,000 people came. The meeting sold out at Labor Day, that's unheard of for a psychotherapy conference, that three months before the conference, you couldn't get a ticket. More than 7,000 people came. The conference was covered by the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and Time Magazine as the centennial of the birth of psychotherapy. Just and, as a quick question, was that a surprise to you, or had you worked diligently setting up all of these media connections and all the publicity and everything? Not really. The publicity followed the conference. People mm -hmm. came because it was an event. And there was a one-page article in Time magazine about the Evolution Conference. I had hatched the idea in about 1983. I started organizing conferences in 1978. My first conference that I organized was 1980. And the idea, well, when you think about the history of psychotherapy, in from in, uh, after World War II, before World War II, psychotherapy was dominated, especially in Europe, by the derivatives of a Freudian approach to psychotherapy, which answers the question, why? Why are people the way that they are? But uh, after, when World War II decimated Europe, psychotherapy moved and found a foothold in the United States and took on the characteristic of American pragmatism. How? How can you help people to get to where it is that they need to go? And in psychotherapy, we can bypass the why because we never really understand why people are the way that they are. You're, you're a physician. You know that if a person has a bacteria, you need to know 
what is that bacteria? Why does the person have this infection? You can't treat the problem unless you know why. But in psychotherapy, you don't necessarily need to know why somebody has a phobia or anxiety or depression or a bad habit. You have technology that can help this person to get from the calcified, stuck state where they are into a more adaptive place. So psychotherapy had a period of wild divergence. You had the development of behavior therapy, humanistic therapy, systems-oriented approaches to psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy, most recently affective neurobiology. And you, you had uh, hundreds of schools of psychotherapy. Well, in 1985, as an impetus to bring together, to integrate, to find out what are some of the consilient factors that make psychotherapy work. Could we bring together all of the titular leaders, 26 members of the faculty in 1985, and could we bring them together? And rather than each person touting the intricacies and benefits of their particular approach, could we start looking for a convergence? What are the underlying principles that make psychotherapy work? And it's my hope that over the years, this will be the 35th anniversary of the evolution of psychotherapy conference, that we have added some impetus to psychotherapy integration. That's, that's, that's really cool. I have a question for you on, on that as somewhat Cynical, uh, I, I strongly applaud what, what you just said, uh, everything that you've said, in fact, and, and the, that's kind of what, what my group at Stanford has been trying to do too, is to say, what, what are the ingredients that make psychotherapy effective and how can we focus on those, put, put those into packages for, for patients rather than creating yet more schools of competing psychotherapy. So I, I'm 200% supporting of, of what you're saying and what you're doing. Sometimes uh, in, the, in the past, I've had chances to work on panels, but, you know, sometimes invited to have multi-speaker panels, and other times I've, I've done workshops alone. And, and over, the, over the years, I, I decided to stop doing multi-speaker uh, panels and just to do workshops on my own because what I observed, and, and this is maybe my, my cynicism, but that uh, most people, when, when there are like four different schools of therapy, you know, on the same panel trying try to discuss something, that, that they, they seem to be trying to promote themselves and put the others down r rather than to, to find the, the common d dialogue. And uh, so I, I just got kind of, kind of fed up that up with it, but that this might be a problem that you've solved because of your own warm, open, receptive uh, style and personality and, and placing trust and, and confidence in, in people. But have you ever noticed that that those those two ten I'm, I'm sure you have seen those two tendencies and how you've you've thought about that because. I, I used to sit down with uh, Albert Ellis. You know, I just I, I just loved the guy because he was honest. He was a kook, but he was honest, and I and he had many great original ideas, and he had a lot of integrity. Wild and weird, yes, but he, we 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 loved him. But he used to tell me what uh, sociopaths, almost all of the famous people in the history of psychiatry and psychology, have been uh, narcissistic, uh, self self promoting, really kind of dishonest people. And, you know, I, I would have to say my own experience, I'm not talking about myself here, but <laughs> <laughs> there, there was an awful, an awful lot of truth in, 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 in that. Uh, and, and, you know, I've been hoping to push the field more into a science, data-driven science of therapy rather than, a, uh, you know, competing schools with gurus. But uh, That's what I was going to ask too. When, you know, I think it's such a beautiful um, goal or to you know integrate psychotherapy theories, but how how do you manage competition between theorists or people who, ha who have just such a strong attachment to their belief? Well, it, there's been an, like an ecumenical council where everybody has their own religion and wants to tout their religion, and that's how the evolution conference started. 
but even at the first conference in 1985, we had Salvador Mnuchin, who I adored, and Sal talked about my many voices. He talked about how his family therapy was based in the way that Virginia Satir talked through him, Murray Bowen talked through him, Jay Haley talked through him. And rather than touting structural family therapy, he talked about the integrative forces. Whereas in the early days of the evolution conference, people were touting their approach, mine way is better than your way. But now it's been that people have been looking over the fence and the artificial turf is green on both sides of the fence and say, well, you know, I do something like that too. And that a cognitive behavioral approach to working, for example, with a borderline personality disorder could be structurally similar to a psychodynamic approach. The theory would might be very different. But as Arnold Lazarus, one of the speakers at the early evolution conference would say, you could have theoretical certainty and technical eclecticism. We just want to help people. And if we can help people by using cognitive behavioral approaches or humanistic approaches or systemic approaches, the important thing is to help people. And there's no one right way to do psychotherapy. There might be a right way to set a bone or a right medicine for working with a, a viral infection, but there's no right way to do psychotherapy. And it's a it kind of an idiosyncratic profession because a lot depends on the stylistic orientation of the therapist and the way in which the therapist and the patient fit. Now, I'm a little different from David in that way because I'm not as scientifically oriented as David is. I'm much more oriented into the art of communication. How can we empower communication to help somebody to, to move from an unadaptive concept to a more adaptive adaptive concept, which will empower a more adaptive state, which will empower a more adaptive identity. So my... We sometimes say that things trickle down from the top in organizations, and I think the uh, tone of the uh, your conferences are tones of warmth and openness and acceptance and people hanging out and really having fun being together, and I, I think a lot of that is because of you and the example that you've that you've set and uh, you're, you deserve all the credit in the world for this phenomenal thing and it's and it, it's ongoing success uh, year after year and decade after decade is is, uh, is really a tribute to, 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 to you Jeff. Uh, what, what are some of the uh, treats that, that people can be looking forward to in the upcoming uh, December 2020 Evolution Conference in, in beautiful Anaheim, California. And let me say that even the setting there, there, there's these three gorgeous hotels that are all kind of like around a big kind of patio area. And things are going on in all of these areas at the, at the same time. Uh, I, I know, I, I believe Beck is going to be there. And isn't he like like 100 years old now or close, something? Close, close. He's so, indefatigable, and he'll appear from a video. We'll do a video conference with Tim Beck, and he's been a marvelous uh, supporter of the Evolution Conference. David, it, it's early March. It's the 2nd of March. We have 3, 000, more than 3,400 people who have already registered wow. to come to Anaheim in December, and wow. we haven't even made the program available. The, the meeting has become iconic, and people come from all over the world. There's more than 100 people from Australia who are already registered, 300 wow. people from Canada. People come from 40 or 50 countries for uh, five days, seven days, if you attend the pre and post conference, because people are avid to learn and they're av av avid to learn from some of the masters who they've studied in graduate school. So it's an event. and. Uh, I, even uh, proximate to Disneyland in 1990, I rented Disneyland. We had a private party on an evening and uh, to see Albert Ellis in Disneyland was worth the uh, entire uh, adventure of renting Disneyland. But wow. you could be a psychotherapist and from eight o'clock to midnight in December of 1990, uh, you, could, uh, you could go on every attraction in Disneyland within four hours. How did, you two, how did you two become acquainted with each other? And how long have you been involved with this, David? But how did you two become acquainted with each other? Jeff will have to answer that because I, I don't remember. 
well, uh, you know, uh, David's contributions are so massive and anybody who has made contributions of, of that extent is going to be invited to the Evolution Conference. And it's been a pleasure for me to be able to come to Palo Alto and to attend David's drop-in group and see how he is um, making the world a better place, the world of psychotherapy a better place by making training available for free for those who are really interested in learning about his approach. So I can't remember the uh, first time, but I was glad that at the last evolution conference, we had an opportunity to dialogue about uh, uh, different approaches to psychotherapy. And I'm always glad to learn something from David. The, uh, uh, I've just always been so uh, grateful. And, and, the, and the brief psychotherapy conferences in between the evolutions, I mean, they're equally equally mind-blowing, but uh, we had the, the pleasure of having Jeff stay here at our house w one night and then came and did your fantastic presentation of uh, your indirect hypnosis at, in, in the group with one of the students who was having a lot of trouble procrastinating to c complete her, her dissertation. Then after Jeff's demo, she eventually did complete her PsyD and, you know, went on, married as baby in a, in a great career. But I had, you remember, Obi, who right. I just, I loved him more than life itself. And I mean, we were the, the best of friends, but you know, he's, he, he was very human. And when Jeff was here, I think Obi felt a little threatened. I, I've told you this story, but I've got to repeat it. And we, Jeff and I were sitting right here. He was in this chair and that, I was in that chair and we were working on the computer just, just like this. And Obi did not like it. I mean, he was aware that Jeff had slept here that night and, you know, we were hanging out and schmoozing. And the modem was right down there. Uh, the plane to the ground. Yeah, it was right, like that. right there. It wasn't that modem, but it was a little flat modem. And he looked at, up, up at us kind of like, I'm going to teach you a thing or two. And then he squatted and peed on the modem <laughs> and turned <laughs> off, <laughs> short circuit and wow. turned off the, the, the internet. Wow, I'll never, never <laughs> forget. I had to go buy a new modem. <laughs> <laughs> that was so technologically astute. Uh, what, what's the best way for, uh, I think we'll have a lot of listeners that, that we, as I was saying, you know, by, by the time December rolls around, a good 15,000 people will have heard this podcast. And what's the best way uh, for them to, to get to, to your website and begin looking at the uh, blurbs and the photos and st stuff in case they want to come, come to this, uh, this evolution of psychotherapy conference in Anaheim, California, December 9 to 9 13. To 4, 13 9 or, to 13, yep. December 9 to yep. 13. Well, it's evolutionofpsychotherapy.com. It's very simple. Just go to the website, evolutionofpsychotherapy.com, and we will send you information about uh, the event. It's a, an event that's a training event. It's not really an event for the public. It's an event where therapists come and the, the attendees have to be licensed in a health science or a mental health science in order to attend the conference. So it's not open to the public. Now, but it's open to students? It's open to students. Grad if you're students. a graduate student in an accredited program, you can certainly come to the Evolution Conference. And we have lots of students who come. And there's even an opportunity for students to volunteer and to be able to offset some of the cost of attendance by volunteering at the conference. And the Evolution Conference um, is it's not the keynote speakers for the evolution conference are not only people within the field of psychotherapy, but we invite stellar experts to uh, who are experts at communication or experts at their social perspectives about civilization, and they come and they also speak. We've had Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan, and uh, we've had Elliot Aronson, a famous social psychologist. And at the upcoming Evolution Conference, uh, we have Alanis Morissette, and I'm going to be interviewing her. Well, Alanis is an expert on communication, musical communication, but music is designed to move the human spirit, and psychotherapy sometimes has the same intent. I invited Rob Capolo, who is a super genius, who is going to do a keynote event, and he's a composer, music historian, conductor. Well, let's look at the underlying grammar of music and let's look at the underlying grammar of psychotherapy. 
I invited Noam Chomsky to have a dialogue about linguistics and psychotherapy, and he'll do that for, through an internet interview. So it's not um, that we're staying insular. We have to recognize that sometimes you advance a field, our field of psychotherapy, by fertilizing it with influences from other communication arts. So I want that to be one of the centerpieces of the Evolution Conference. All of the faculty are capable of keynote speakers at, at any conference. And so we look to move outside of the field of psychotherapy to find keynote speakers who can shed light on the uh, endeavor of helping people to transform themselves from other fields. I've had movie directors, James Foley came at one evolution conference and we could talk about the intersection between the influence structure of music and the influence structure of psychotherapy. These are topics that greatly interest me and they've been a hit for attendees. We had David White, a famous poet at the last evolution conference and we could talk about um, also poetic grammar versus the grammar of psychotherapy. I, I love your thinking, and one of the points that you've made, that you made in your presentation to our group, is that you can think of psychotherapy as, as an experience that you're creating, much like a theatrical production or a musical event, and you like use a lot of those metaphors. When uh, one of the things that we do in the Tuesday group is live therapy uh, with with, with, like what you did that, that night, actually. And we don't do it every week, but we do it maybe once every five weeks or something like that. We'll have three or four seminar rooms simultaneously with a patient in each, who's one of the students, and then treating them. And uh, these things become magical. Uh, usually when, when I'm doing, I, I'm seeing a, a complete transformation of somebody going from intense anxiety and despair and relationship problems, not only a complete recovery, but going further into what you could call joy or enlightenment. Uh, but I've often said in the group, and I've been saying this for maybe 15 years, that when we're doing that and people start to get on this high where, where humans are being transformed at the deepest level with incredible speed, that I feel like we're a jazz band. We're not like doing psychotherapy. It's, it's a, like a new kind of creation that multiple people are contributing to. And it just feels like different musicians are, you know, taking turns, m m making their music. I mean, you've yes. been the target yeah. of that. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so and, you know. But it's not improvisation. No, 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 it's not that. But it's, <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's something. But everybody takes their turn. Yeah, and something fantastic and unique, and it's like the, the, the greatest experiences of, of my life, really, and we do that on the Sunday hikes. I don't think you had a chance to go on one of the Sunday hikes, but... No, I'm sorry. I do that every Monday, and the students come, they show up at my front door at nine o'clock, and we go out and we hike for maybe three hours, sometimes four, and we're just doing personal work all along the way, and various structures get created, and various miracles are happen pretty much every... Sunday, and then we go out and we have a dim sum feast afterwards to kind of uh, celebrate. But it's, 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 it, it is like ma magic, and, and your metaphors fool people. You say, I'm data driven and science based. Well, that sounds all like very boring or logical or something like that. But when, that's just the way of measuring and validating what, what you're doing. But it's really, it's, it's a magical process that's almost, almost beyond words. And, and when you're r really, on what you see could could be described as miracles. People say I, this was a miracle that, that what, what happened, and I, I think you've really brought that that beauty and artistry to to the forefront. And I haven't seen that really. Train and the training I got as a psychiatric resident, or the training I see most people get, you know, delivering in, in graduate schools is much more. You know, people want formulas and cookie cutter stuff and uh, you know, first do this and then do, and then do this. But it's as you pointed out, it's a, a magical nonlinear process where people make orbital transformations in their lives, and it can happen in in unexpected ways from metaphor, from stories, from 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 images, from tears, and and from laughter. 
and I don't know if you use a lot of laughter in therapy, but I, we, we, I don't, we, we, we do. Yeah, we do. My, my <laughs> colleague Marilyn came in for a live thing. We did a podcast on this. It was recorded, but she had just learned two days earlier she had terminal cancer, lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And it was horrible because she did, she never smoked. It was a total shock. And we treated her and she went from, in one session, intense, I mean, it was over the top, rage, fear, and depression. And she went into absolute euphoria by the end. But when I listened to the podcast, I was shocked that we spent about one third of the time giggling uncontrollably. Walter, and I thought, man, that, that sounds disrespectful. But funny things happen, and it contributed to to her to her enlightenment. Like one of her her fears was, you know, that she wasn't religious enough. She's a deeply spiritual woman, and she was losing her belief in the afterlife. And then she was beating up on herself, saying, "I I I should have more faith, and I should believe in the afterlife." And I told her, I, I, says, I said, I don't know, Marilyn, if you know this, but God kind of came to me in a vision once when I was jogging home from the train station in Philadelphia. <laughs> this is actually true. This actually happened. And I was going up Conchahawken State Road to Spear Hill, uh, the last thing before I turn off to, to her house. And, and I said, God came to me in a vision. He says, uh, David, I want you to know that if you believed in me, I'd be deeply disappointed. <laughs> and then I said, I told, my, and I, I told God, I said, don't worry, big guy, I've got your back. <laughs> Sometimes I think humor in therapy is like a Shakespearean comic relief that you can get yeah. a little relief and yeah. then you can go deeper. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I think yeah. it's used. Um, but you know, you said something interesting no in the very beginning, Jeff, when you said, and you know, um, at first, people were going to therapy to find out why they were the way they are, and then, you know, we put As our... therapy developed, uh, that was the interest. The European approach was more based in theory. We need to know why. Wow. And the American approach is more pragmatic based in how. Now, what we're talking about is an experiential orientation. If you want somebody to be enlightened, if you want somebody to laugh, if you want somebody to be responsible, motivated, curious, creative. You can't use an algorithmic approach to get there. Right. You need to create an experience that yeah. is transformative, that right. elicits a conceptual realization that's already been there, but hasn't been activated. You can't say to somebody, I want you to laugh. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to use these three techniques, and then you're going to laugh. You tell somebody a joke, the joke is an inductive experience to realize humor. Now, within the joke, there can be meaning. So it's not out of the question to use a hypnotic procedure and tell somebody a joke while they're hypnotized. Their unconscious mind doesn't lose their sense of humor. And jokes are just another context in which wisdom can be elicited. And my orientation tends to be conceptual. What is the concept that the client needs to realize? How can I create an evocative moment in which the client can realize the concept that has not been activated? And uh, this idea of being experiential is true of all psychotherapies. I think it was Frieda from Reichman, a psychoanalyst who said patients come to therapy for an experience, not for information. So we are creating a symbol drama, a symbolic drama that by living this experience, you can be transformed. And I think that therapists would do well to understand some of the understructure of art because you don't go to a popular movie because you want information. You go to the movie because you want to have an experience. And by the way, movies have influenced more people than psychotherapists art has influenced more people than psychotherapists. So we can, we can take lessons from, uh, that we know. We play music, we listen to music, we understand uh, the way in which music can affect our mood, our perspective. And uh, uh, so a good composer understands about theme and variation, strategic development, uh, being recursive, establishing moments in which there's a cohesive element that builds the drama through the song, even more complex in movies to understand 
communication. In psychotherapy, it's been a tradition that the therapist says words to the patient ears and the patient says words to the therapist ears and therapists haven't gotten the idea that therapy could be a visual art. We could move around the room, we could do things, posture, gesture, tone, tempo, uh, and uh, proximity and we can use all of the different output channels of communication to embroider an effect. It's not just the message. It's all about how the message can be delivered and empowered. And we can do these things by thinking in a more evocative uh, 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 train when the goal is a conceptual realization. If you're just explaining to people what's the difference between an assertive act, an aggressive act, and a passive act, you just give people information and you don't have to worry so much about the way in which it's presented. But if you want somebody to realize responsibility, you have to think about the process of developing that concept, how to stage it, how to follow through on it, what kind of packaging you want for the person to have the realization. And you're thinking more like an artist than you are thinking like a scientist at that moment. There's a improvisational moments that make simple ideas come alive. If you want somebody to be healthy, that's a simple idea, but they have to move that from what they know in their left hemisphere to what they realize in their right hemisphere and in their body. And the the bridge between what we know and what we realize is an experiential moment. And suddenly we realize I can be a therapist, I can be responsible, I can be a good parent, I can be a healthy person, I can exercise. And we have to have a little evocative moment in which we jump into the concept that it is that we've been seeking. So not all of psychotherapy is about conceptual communication, but this is the area that I explore. I think that's so beautifully stated. The uh, uh, what, what we're trying to get the, the 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 patient or the person, the client, whatever you want to refer to the person you're working with, the uh, an, an experience of awe and and wonder that they experience at at all levels. It, it, it just you can't just explain something and and expect something to to happen. I. I remember when I was in college, I was driving with a, a college friend from Phoenix where, where we lived and we were trying to get back to Amherst, Massachusetts, but we had to drive this car to Chicago first, an, an old car. <clears throat> and the first night we got up to the uh, edge of the Grand Canyon uh, and we just pulled the car over and got out and put out our sleeping bags and, and just went, went to sleep. I, I wasn't exactly sure where, where we were, except either, oh, here's a piece of ground, we'll just lie down here. And then, um, and I had, although we lived in Phoenix, I'd been to have a Supai Canyon, uh, which is not the same as the Grand Canyon, it's an offshoot, uh, but I'd never been to the main Grand Canyon. And, um, and so when we woke up, I realized that, uh, you know, the sun was coming up and our, my sleeping bag was about six inches from the edge of the cliff. And, and I looked out and saw the Grand Canyon for the first time with the sun coming up, and it just took my breath away. And you you can't uh, you can't uh, explain that or you can't capture it on a postcard or or you you have to be there and, and have that experience. And once you've had it, it's unmistakable. And I often think of the technique we use, the acceptance paradox, as also a kind of uh, you know it takes your breath away your breath away, you've got to experience it in an interaction with the therapist using externalization of voices or feared fantasy or, or whatever technique. But when you see it, it just, it's, 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 it's an event that you'll, you'll never, you'll never forget. And, and, and it's exactly what you're saying, Jeff, it has to be uh, an experience that that's created in, in the, in, in the therapy session. We got to close off here pretty quick here, but I just wanted to, one more thing here that, uh, we, we could talk all all afternoon here and learn so much from you, uh, Jeffrey. But uh, I know you you were probably a young a young man when you first met uh, Milton Erickson, and and you've uh, dedicated your institute to him and his memory and his teachings. I, I don't know if you want to just tell us 
about your first meeting with him or how, how you feel about, about him, what, what you learn from, from him. I know you have a very uh, intense passion for, for what he gave to you and, and for what he, he's given to the field of psychotherapy. Well, I've met many uh, wizards, Virginia Satir and uh, Salvador Mnuchin and Victor Frankl and Tim Beck and Joseph, uh, Wolf, Joseph Wolpe. And uh, out of all of the people that I have met, Erickson was the most impressive. This was a man who was crippled from polio, who spent the last 13 years in his wheelchair, practically quadriplegic, not really. I mean, he had use of his uh, arms and uh, uh, sometimes in order to feed himself, he'd have to use his entire body to bring a spoon to his mouth. And uh, his vision was double, his hearing was impaired. He wasn't wearing a denture in his mouth. He had to relearn how to speak without a denture. 26 years old, I, was, I had a master's degree. I was a licensed therapist in California, licensed marriage and family therapist. And I got the opportunity to be with Erickson. I came to Phoenix because I wanted to learn about hypnosis and psychotherapy and his techniques. But within the first hours of being there, I just didn't even care about those things anymore. I just wanted to be around him because I felt like I was with someone who mastered life. This was a deeply wounded man in constant chronic pain who just wanted to help other people and wanted other people to thrive. And it was the quintessential wounded healer, somebody who could do an alchem alchemical transformation of his own wounds into wanting to help others, sincerely wanting other people to be better by virtue of his wizardry. And yes, he was a genius and he was the most interesting communicator that, I, that I've met, but uh, I just was so moved by him personally and wanted to spend as much time as I could around him because as I said, I felt I was with somebody who had really mastered life under very difficult circumstances and had this incredible drive to do whatever he could with the little he had and make the world a better place by virtue of that. I'm writing Erickson's biography right now and I'm trying to communicate some of my passion about who Erickson was as an inspirational person and how other people can uh, look at the virtue of their faults and they can find a virtue in their faults. And Erickson was a, a living, breathing example of somebody who was doing that kind of a transformation. When he talked with you, he wasn't speaking hypothetically or hypocritically. If he said you can enjoy life in spite of limitations, he was doing it. If he said you can enjoy life because of pain, in spite of pain, he was doing it right in front of your eyes. So when he was uh, talking with people, um, the the power not only came from his brilliance, his genius, his clinical wizardry, but it also came from the fact that he was so congruent. Well, thank you so much. That was beautifully stated. You might want to have that transcribed for your new book, maybe <laughs> like the foreword or something, because I can't imagine it being said any more beautifully than the way you you, you said it. You just, uh, yeah, that's very inspirational. Oh, super. Well, you were both wonderful. It was just a pleasure to have time with you. I, I'm sorry, David, that we don't get more time together, that we live, that we don't live more proximate. Well, when you're heading up in the Bay Area, you'll have to do it another, I know, another over, trip. overnighter and come to the Tuesday group and do another demo or watch us do our demo or, or whatever and just, just hang out again. Well, that'll be a promise. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Uh, Lots of love. If you Thank want, you. We'll, we'll maybe do another one of these, uh, maybe two months, if you want, before the uh, December conference. And... It would be a pleasure. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes to this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donsel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.